Let's go to the next one. And this says the same thing. Let's go again. Okay. Um, uh, what's interesting is we like to look. So that was the commonality. Everybody's doing the same, and it's catching up. So whatever you know here will become the standard worldwide. But there are some differences, and it's worth touching on them. So if you look at the average number of friends on a social network and brand friends. Now the reason we pull out brand friends, and I do think this is a job that most people in communications, particularly public relations, have done very badly, is I think we've abdicated the space to the ad agencies relative to this piece. But if you look at the brand friend, most of the largest brands, as of today, in the world, have more people visit them on their social network site, their Facebook site, than they have on their website. So the website is becoming not irrelevant, but less relevant, particularly in a branded space. And the Facebook, which is dedicated to the community around it, is becoming more important. So that's why they distinguish between all my friends versus my brand friends. Because I really might like Coke, or in my case, in my case you know, uh, Tsingtao beer. You know, so you, you, I have some friends, I might have some friends here. And this is the average number. So if you look at the broad population here, is that you're seeing so far, there's a four or five seems to be the peak of where you see brand friends, but the number of friends online dramatically changes around the world, and China and India still, has, still have less friends. Now, what we don't understand, is that just the case because it's still newer? There's still caution being disposed? Is that going to grow? So does Japan, by the way, have le less friends. Or is this a cultural dynamic? This is the environment I move in. I'm not yet comfortable moving into friends I don't really know as friends. What, what is driving this? We don't know. The two schools of thought, one is that there are cultural nuances here we need to respect. The other one is it's a matter of time and it will follow and the number of friends will move up to. Let's go to the next one. And then if we just go to the brand interaction, which is the brand fans piece, is the percentage actively looking for brands also changes. So Indians have more brand friends, but they find them intrusive. The Chinese have less brand friends, but they're actively looking for them. So that piece of insight alone for Procter & Gamble is worth a fortune. That one piece of insight. How you connect with people on brands, particularly using social networks, changes. But it also means that because of the internet penetration and the cost of marketing, many of these Chinese and Indian companies are experimenting they're really at the forefront in terms of how you deploy social media, earned media. What are the experiments that work and don't work? Because this is a series of experiments. Let's go to the next one. So just to summarize on that piece, so we call them super connected communities. And I think you're seeing nets of them merge. They're no longer in pockets, they're nets. Um, these type of new, new types of networked individuals are not necessarily amenable to existing models for segmentation and they blur historic and social connections. I think it's important. The whole research industry is going through hell because the heart of a research is to be able to segment an audience to allow a marketer to talk to them. And guess what? The people of the 21st century don't want to be segmented. We don't want to be segmented. You know, I, you know I, I'm not going to be called a hippie or a baby boomer. I'm, I could be all of those things. Or an old fart. I'm probably all of those things, depending on which hour of the day you want to get to me. <laughs> so we're not going to be segmented. Well, if it applies to us, why wouldn't it apply to the emerging world? And they are still more homogeneous relative to spend, earning power, education, consumption patterns. They still are more homogeneous. But they also are beginning to refuse to be segmented. As elite digital natives, demand communication activities to be smarter, more integrated, and more personal. So the personalization of communication is a big deal. That's why the social networking around brands is more important than the website. And that's why communicating clearly with the millennials, and if you go for where those emerging markets are, their dominant population are the millennials, except in China, they're under 30s. In India, in the Middle East, in Africa, they're under 30. That's the age, that's the pro age profile of the population. They want to be communicated at a personalized level. They don't want to hear the corporate gobbledygook. They don't accept it. They don't trust it. They don't believe it. They don't believe in authority so much because they're the empowered generation. They don't necessarily give authority the benefit of the doubt or respect authority figures. 
When I was in India recently, there's a huge amount of pride uh, amongst Indians about their successful Indian companies. You know, the white pros and the Infosys and the Tatas of the world and the Mittals. And Indians are very proud of being Indian. They're less proud about their government which for many years has been a kind of source of Indian pride, you know, in terms of growing and changing the country. So it's, it's very interesting. China is the exact opposite, by the way. Um, for, for those in America who would look at China and say, why would the Chinese government be doing that? Let me tell you, when you go to China and you talk to Chinese, the pride the Chinese people have in the Chinese government is manifest. And you belittle that at your peril. Well, it, 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 the fact is compulsory, but the fact is it's volunteered. I mean, if you've gone through five generations of this being your life, it becomes part of who you are. So we're all multiple citizens now. This is the world, our country and our chosen online tribes. We're no longer just sitting here in Washington, D.C., but our home is in another city. We're living in tribes. Now, if you see this in the sustainability world, if you see this in, say, the NGO world, if you're looking at economic development or if you're looking at sustainable agriculture or you're looking at uh, sustainable food supplies or you're looking at um, carbon footprints, um, you could pick the subject. That community very quickly goes global. It's no longer just in your backyard. And it's informing how things are done. So let me give you uh, a manifestation of that that most people in this room perhaps wouldn't feel. So we're sitting in the capital city of the world's most powerful democracy and despite what at least the Republican Party would hate, say about this country making too many laws. There are more laws being made in China and in Brussels right now than the whole of the United States. And online, if you go online, which by the way, I can now outsource regulators. If I'm in one of these emerging markets, if I'm like Pakistan, I can't afford to have my teams of scientists. I have some scientists. I can't have teams of scientists or in Egypt. I can't have so many scientists checking food labeling and environmental <coughs> sourcing and, and, uh, and, and how you treat employees and, and air pollution standards and what about the medicines coming to my country, are they safe and what's the dosage levels for children or adults or what happens to the exceptions. It, teams of scientists. I don't have to do that. I can outsource that. How do I do that? I just go, what is the best accepted practice on rule X? And by the way, guess where it is right now? It's called China and, and, the, and Europe, who are increasingly aligning a lot of their rule-based systems. So I can just go, oh, what is the EU rule on that? Oh, well, if it's good enough for the Europeans, it can be good enough for me. So I do not have to invest in this lengthy regulatory consultative cycle. I can basically present back to my people in my country, Regulation X seems to have the support of the Chinese and the Europeans. It's got to be good enough for us. So you have reduced regulatory cycles, massively reduced. It goes along with this new world. And we expect brands and branded communications to be as smart as connected we are, and that's just table stakes. That's just the basics. That's not, that's not even getting you differential. That's just the basics. So they're the facts. Now, just a quick summary. So is communications being reforged? Well, it's both global and local. It's fixed and mobile. It's brand and personal. It's formal and informal. And I'd be happy to open up to you. My sense is this is the most exciting time to be in the world of communications that you can be in. And let me answer my question why that is. And I'll open it up to you if you have a point of view that we can talk about it. It's incredibly exciting because guess what? It matters. Most people I've talked about in professional communications have struggled their entire career demonstrating that what we do is really important. I'm seeing a few nods, OK? I'm getting some, some feedback here. And guess what? Now, even if success isn't recognized, failure really is. <laughs> and the bar for failure is going down, and the bar for success is going up. So it's enormously important time because professional communication is at the heart of both this production and consumption issue relative to content, relative to growing wealth around the world. It also means as companies are going around the world, it's no longer about just sales and marketing, which is what, how they did. That was globalization in the first round. Increasingly, it's about, well, what kind of company are they? What kind of citizen are they? If you are an American company going to China, um, Unless you pay an absolute premium to market for talent, increasingly Chinese 
postdoctoral graduates or MBAs would rather work for a Chinese company. I know that because we've done the research. And Indians would prefer to work for an Indian company. It's just a preference. It's not a guarantee. You can, it doesn't mean you can't hire very bright, smart Chinese. And if that was the case, we'd be in trouble as effectively an American multinational. But they have a preference because of their pride in their country and where they see it going. So what are some of the points of difference relative to recruitment? Well, one is the reason why you can sometimes is they see that American brands can be better employers of people if they have the right kind of attitude can have a much better sense of culture as a company and also have a much greater commitment to global citizenship. This concept global citizenship comes out and they think that many Indian and Chinese companies understand less because of the history what being a global citizen is. They understand being an Indian citizen or a Chinese citizen but what a global citizen is. So it's a huge opportunity relative to the whole world of sustainability and CSR and employee communications. An enormous opportunity. And it's not just as you've done it before. You have to take into account this polygot, complex world. But an enormous opportunity. So I think it's a very exciting time. But so I don't overstay my welcome. Does anybody have a point of view? Anybody disagree radically, directionally, that this is what's going to change the world and what's going to happen?